Let's do this today. Let's do this. Uh, I want to read to you out of the book of Ephesians a a great verse of Scripture in chapter 6. To the church that loved God the most, Paul spends more time talking about battling with them than any other church. You know, it's a, you have to watch. When Paul gives somebody a promise, you have to watch who he gives it to because a lot of people just go in there, oh, I'll take that one. Well, if you're not doing what those people were doing, then you're going to be out of luck. Uh, for instance, like, uh, uh, in, in, well, never mind. I, I won't get into that. But for instance, in Philippians, and my God shall supply all your need according to his grace. Now, the reason he made that promise to them is, number one, they were giving. Yeah, and number two, they were content in whatever state they were in. Because we like to quote that scripture, my God shall supply your need, but it doesn't start with a my, it starts with an and. And you have to look at what's before it. But anyway, okay, here we go. Ephesians 6, that had absolutely nothing to do with what we're going to do. Ephesians 6, 13, uh, so put on all the armor that God gives you, all of it. Then, when that evil day comes, you will be able to defend yourself. Wow. Oh, I need to defend myself. And when the battle is over, and it will be over, you will still be standing firm. Now, here's another uh, rendition of that. Uh, So, put on God's armor now. That when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist the enemy's attacks. And after fighting to the end, you will still hold your ground. I was just speaking with Sylvia. We were having a little prophetic moment there. Uh, She'd been to a a football game last night. uh, And uh, I said, well, did the uh, Roadrunners win the game? And she said, no. She said, but we were leading uh, first half, and then we got behind, and then we caught up right at the end, and then right at the end, we dropped the ball. And I said, wow. I've heard a lot of testimonies like that. I got to the end and I dropped the ball. This is not the time to drop the ball. Wherever you are in the kingdom and wherever God's taking you and whatever the Lord is doing with you right now, this is not the time to drop the ball because you and I face We have faced, we are facing, and we will face what Paul calls that evil day. The evil day. Now, what is that? That is a time of more intensive, intensified, amplified spiritual pressure than what is normal. Not every day is an evil day. Thank you, Jesus. But there are some days, some seasons, some moments, some times when the pressure is amplified. Things get more intense. And Paul is instructing us on this evil day. The Phillips translation says it's uh, it's when evil has its day of power. Now, when you have an evil day... It is because you are on the brink of a great victory or a loss. Because in an evil day, it can go either way. You know, some people think victory is assured. Well, I just, well, I, I, no matter what I do, victory is, no. No, you remember Moses in the desert, right? Hands up, we win. Hands down, oop, let's don't talk about that, huh? And so it is an evil day is when you could make great gain in the kingdom, but also see loss at the same time. So an evil day then is when it could go either way. Let me give you some uh, uh, synonyms and code words in the Bible for an evil day. Uh, valley of decision. Now that's a great that's a great term. You're in the valley of decision because that the imagery in that statement 
is like you are on the business end of a sharp pointed spear or sword. That this is, uh, you're in the trenches, literally, is, is the imagery behind that. Uh, you're in the heat of battle. Uh, the battle turns to the gate. Now, there's always skirmishes going on. Uh, uh, it's some, for some people, it's a battle to get out of bed in the morning, so that's a skirmish. But we're talking about when the battle turns to the gate and when things get really intense. By the way, where's your gate? Here's your gate right here. And the enemy wants to come against the gates of your kingdom, the gates of your spirit, the gates of your life. And this is, where, this is why Samson, when he uh, knew that his life was in danger, he went to the city gates, he pulled up the gates, and he put them up in a higher place. He set them up on top of the hill. So he's r literally raising his perspective as what we would call it in the spirit. It's also called a day of trouble. Uh, it can be called the flood, the fire, the storm. No amens yet. The day of testing, trial by fire. And oh, here's a good one, walking through fire. And you say, Pastor Buddy, I cannot believe that that would ever be in the Bible. Well, yes it is, and here's where it is. Peter said it. Here's what Peter said. Dear friends, don't be surprised or shocked. <laughs> don't be surprised or shocked. Never be surprised or shocked that you are going through testing. Now, I'm having a little difficulty reading that. We're going to have to replace that projector by that because I thought it said going through hell, but it says going through testing. <laughs> that is like walking through fire. Now, this is interesting. Peter says this is a test. And the test is not the challenge. The test is not the crisis. The test is not the problem. The test is not the need. The test is, are you ready? Is my response to that. That's where the test is. The challenge, the need, the crisis, the tragedy, the hurt, the pain. That is the battle. That's the challenge. But the test is my response to that. Because you see, Paul says we have to defend ourselves. If you don't do anything on the day of battle, you will be taken under. Because you have to defend yourself. Now, when we talk about defending yourself, in this world today, my gosh, everybody is on about defending. Oh, you're in my personal space. And oh, I, I have to defend my rights. And I have to uh, defend my, my opinions. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about you have to stand in who you are and what you are and who God is or you will get run over. And then you're going to need a lot of prayer and a lot of counseling. And you're going to need a lot of help from other people. And you're going to be way back in the back and somebody's going to go, well, what happened to our front line? Well, the front line got taken out because they didn't defend themselves. Seriously, folks, if somebody comes in my house with a gun... What are we going to do? Oh, okay. Take everything, Mr. Robert. That's okay. No. We defend ourselves. Paul says, you defend yourself in the day of evil. Now, the weapons and things that we use are the things that will allow us to make a right response in the day of evil. Because when the day of evil comes, by the way, uh, you could have just had one. I think everybody in the room, you've either just had one, you're in one, or you're getting ready to have one. So nobody's left out. And, and if somebody comes to me after and says, Pastor Buddy, I don't know I, that I've ever experienced a day of evil. I'm going to step back. <laughs> because you're overdue. <laughs> it took me about 20 years to figure out what a day of evil was. I'd been going through them. I had just called them other things. Like, <laughs> that are not, Okay. So Paul says, defend yourself. So here we go. Here, here it is right here. Where, here's where we're going. What kind of a response do you need to make in the day of evil? Now, the, these kind of responses are, are tough things. In other words, they're things that you have to do prophetically. You have to do intentionally. Uh, they're not going to come naturally to you. And so uh, we're going to 
talk about today, I want to give you uh, about two or three different responses that you can have in the day of evil that will make uh, a big difference for you. Okay, because here's what happens. You see, it's not what I'm walking in, but it's how I'm walking that's going to make the difference. It's not all the junk that's happening. It's how I respond to all of that that secures the victory and secures my gain and allows me to be approved in the midst of the testing. So, uh, here we go. Let me give you the first one. And and by the way, these are really deep. If you haven't been to Bible college, you're probably not going to get these. Uh, Here's the first one. Keep going. You know, it is amazing how powerful it is when you just refuse to quit. When you just say, I'm not slowing down. I'm not going to get deterred or detoured or distracted or misdirected in some way by something that is happening to me. I will not allow it to slow me down. This Jamaican guy was at the pastor's conference and he was likening pastoring to driving a bus. And he said, Mon, when you're on that bus and you're driving that bus, he said, you just got to keep on driving. He said, you pull up and some people get off your bus, some people get on your bus, but you keep driving. Some people are going to get off, some people are going to get on, some people are not going to ever get on, but you keep driving that bus, man. You keep driving that bus. <laughs> and I thought, that's it! That's it! You keep on driving, man. <laughs> you keep going. You know, listen, when Israel, when Israel uh, 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 came out of Egypt, they thought, man, we're, we're, God's on, we're, 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 it's, it's, we're done. This is it. We're, we're on our way. All of a sudden, they face the Red Sea. And, and so they just get distracted with that. And so God comes to Moses and he says, would you please tell my people to keep moving? Go forward. Don't stop here. The, you see, when the... Oftentimes, when we face an evil day, we stop praying, we stop worshiping, we stop celebrating, we start thanking God, we get less passionate, we back up, we move back, we retreat, we get intimidated, and God said, no, in an evil day, first of all, you keep going. Whatever direction you're going in, you keep going. Don't you stop. Don't you look at what's going on around you. You keep going. Don't you back off your prayer. Don't stop believing. Don't stop hoping. Don't stop celebrating. Don't stop praying. You keep going. Let me give you a scripture. Persecution is inevitable for those who are determined to live really Christian lives. I don't know what a really Christian life is. That must be like sort of a born-again Christian. I don't know of any other kind of Christian, but people say that I'm a born-again Christian. Well, what other kind is there? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Look, you must go on steadily in all those things. What does that say? Keep going. Go on steadily in all those things that you have learned and which you know are true. In other words, I am, number one, going to keep going. Listen to this one. Take the old prophets as your mentors. This is James 5. They put up with anything and went through everything. I, you know, I'm wondering, I, I'm amazed how many people say, oh, I, I, you know, God's making me a prophet. God, I'm going to be a prophet. That's, uh, that's my gifting. That's who I am. I'm a prophet. Oh, good. Well, you better be ready to put up with anything and go through everything. And never once quit all the time honoring God. I'm on it. Oh, man, this is, uh, we're in the midst of it. We're in the stew. We're in the soup. Hey, you know what we're doing? We're honoring God. Honoring God. Number one, we're going to keep going. You know what I love about David? He looked at that ugly, nasty giant. It was so intimidating. You know what he did? Oh, I'm going forward. He said, I'm not going to allow that ugliness of what's happening around me, to me, in me. I'm not going to allow it to stop me. I'm going to, number one, I'm going to keep going. All right? Promise? Keep going. Somebody hits a hard time, you say, man, when's the last time you've been reading your Bible? Well, you know, I just sort of, I just sort of stopped. I got a little bit discouraged. Keep going. Keep going. Go back. Keep going. Get on. 
Number one, keep going. You ready? Here's number two. I like this one. You ready? Here we go. You got it? Look up. You know what happens when when the evil day comes? Here's what we do. Oh, man, I can't believe how bad it is. This is really tough. I I don't know how I don't know how this happened. You know, you know, because you see in an evil day, sometimes you see it coming. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's coming at you. Sometimes it blindsides you. And boy, when those things blindside you, that can be pretty tough. Sometimes you're expecting it. Sometimes you're not expecting it. And so here's what happened. Israel is in the desert with God. And they're not getting on too well. And in Numbers 21, uh, these snakes start coming and biting them. Fiery serpents. And they are biting them and people are dying. In the, in the, and so the people are crying out to, to Moses, what do we do? Help us. Uh, we're dying. Now, you have to get the, the scene here. The, the snakes are continuing to bite the people. And so God says to Moses, Moses says, God, what do I do? And here's God's remedy. Make another one. Make another one out of brass. In fact, here's the scripture. I think I have it for you. Oh, no, I didn't finish that. Oh, you, oh, you got to get this. This is the last bit of James. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. Yeah. Woo! Look at that. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. I forgot to give you that bit. That's a good bit. Okay, here it is. Numbers 21. Here it is. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a banner, and it came to pass that when a serpent bit anyone, he beheld the serpent of brass and lived. Now, you've got to think about this. God says, I want you to make another serpent. Now, this is not a piece of origami. We're talking about a forged, hammered, uh, metal, brass image. Now, you don't do this in an hour. This takes time. And so I'm thinking, okay, God, these people are, we're all getting bit because we've all been there. We're all getting bit. And yet we're saying, okay, God, where's the remedy? And so Moses is saying, God, do you know how long it's going to take us to do this? I mean, this is not an hour. This is going to take a while. And so here's Moses. He's got to be doing this to the people. He's saying, hey, look, God's remedy is on the way. But what I need you to do is I just need you to keep looking up this way. You keep looking, because we're getting ready to lift up something that's going to bring the remedy and the solution and the life that you're looking for. But you have to keep looking up at it. Even though you don't see it yet, you got to keep looking up because ultimately we're going to get it lifted up on the pole. Now Jesus said that's exactly the way the kingdom, he said just as Moses lifted up the serpent, when I am lifted up, uh, I will draw all men unto me. And so this they are being challenged to keep your looking up because you see when you're getting bit, the challenge is always and the, the, the pressure is to always look down at what's biting you. Look down at what's happening around you. So Moses said, no, keep it up. Now watch. When they started to look up and he raised that serpent up, he made it out of brass. It would have been nicer looking if it had been gold. And it would have been more attractive if it had been silver. But God said you make a brass one. Because brass, when, you, it, when it's highly polished, is like a mirror. You see, in the Old Testament, they didn't have glass mirrors. They had brass mirrors. And so they, they call them, uh, King James calls them looking glasses. And so you, they polish this brass, highly polished, and then it gives a great reflection where you can actually see yourself. And so it works as a mirror. So when, they are, when Moses is lifting up the serpent, if they will look at that instead of this, what they will see is the reflection of all of those other serpents in that serpent and know that God... God has judged all of that because brass is the metal of judgment. And so they get God's perspective if they will look up. They will see this judge. They will see this defeated. They will see this taken care of if they will look up. And so it is with us. God says, you got to keep looking up. Keep going. Look up. And let me give you one more. 
Oh, I have a scripture for you. I like this one. This is the Hebrew scripture. We must keep our eyes where? On Jesus, who leads us and makes our faith complete. So keep your mind on Jesus. Wow. Wow. Now that's a challenge. We're not talking about stuff here that's just natural. It's automatic. No, these are prophetic things. This is, a, this is, a, this is a, a faith decision. So keep your mind on Jesus who put up with many insults from sinners. Then you won't get discouraged and give up. Yeah. Keep going. Look up. And let me give you one more. Ready? Hold on. Hold on. There's an interesting scripture in the Old Testament. I've always loved this scripture, and I love the guy that, it, that, there, that the Lord is speaking about here. Uh, his name is Eliezer. And in 2 Samuel 23, it says, he uh, remained standing right where he was. He was in the midst of a battle. Everybody else retreated. Everybody else ran away. But he stayed there. He held his ground. And he fought so hard against the Philistines that he became exhausted and he couldn't even let go of his sword. And the Lord magnificently delivered them that day. So here is a guy who's deciding, you know what? I'm going to hold. I'm going to hold fast. Now watch what happens. Here is a Hebrew scripture that everybody loves and everybody knows that I want to uh, review with you and, and get down in your spirit again. And it's Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what does that mean? That means that what he told me yesterday is still true today. And it will be true tomorrow. If he is faithful yesterday, then he is will be faithful today and faithful tomorrow. So whatever he told me when the sun was shining, I can trust that when it's dark. Whatever he told me in the light, I can hang on to in the night because he is the same and does not change. Nothing about what he has said has ever changed. When he tells it to me, then it's just as good this day and that day regardless of what is going on around me. So what do I need to hold on to? One of the things I need to hold on to are my convictions, the things that I know to be true. You see, if you judge God faithful before the evil day, you have to judge Him faithful in the evil day and through the evil day. I have to hold on to that. So many times people say, oh yes, I trust God. Yes, oh God's so good. And then you get in the thing and all of a sudden God is now the baddie. He's now the meanie. He's now the one who's, who has, uh, who's failed and, and hasn't done what he's supposed to do. No, if he has said it then, it is still true now. He was faithful then. He is faithful now. Now, oftentimes in the midst of the storm, what happens is we start throwing things overboard. Now, we all do this. We get in a storm and we look for anything to throw overboard. Acts uh, 27. Paul's on the ship in the midst of the storm. What are they doing? They're throwing everything overboard. And all of this stuff is valuable stuff that they're throwing over. You don't ever want to throw overboard your convictions. You must not ever let go of what God has said. Regardless. Now, let me give you a couple of of, uh, of encouraging scriptures to go with that. Here it is, Hebrews 10. So don't throw it away now. Don't throw it all away now. You were sure of yourselves then. It's still a sure thing, but you need to stick it out. Staying with God's plan so you'll be there for the promised completion. And here's another one. It won't be long now. He's on the way. He'll show up at any minute. But anyone who is right with me thrives on loyal trust. Okay, I'm trusting you. If he cuts and runs, I won't be very happy. This is God speaking. But we're not quitters. 
We're not quitters who lose out. Oh no, we'll stay with it and survive what? Trusting all the way. I must hold to my convictions. One of the things that the evil day tries to do is to get you to throw overboard the things that you were once sure about. That you and I ought to be sure about in the midst of that. Regardless of what it looks like and regardless of what we're facing, there are some non-negotiables that do not ever go overboard. Those are my convictions and my confessions. What I am declaring, what I am saying, those things I will not jettison. I will not let go of those. The things that I have confessed before, the things that I have professed before are the very things that I am going to continue to say. If I am declaring God to be faithful, then I am still going to declare that. I am not going to mix now my words with things that are not according to the Word. I will hold fast my profession. Now, here is a scripture. Well, You have noticed my servant. Oh, this is God. Look at this. Have you noticed my servant Job? Now, who's God talking to? Satan. Now, there are times when you really wish that God would not talk to the devil about you. I prefer anonymity. Now, he didn't do this once. He did it twice. Twice God brings up Job to Satan. Job's going, no, no. Look what he said. Well, have you noticed my servant Job, the Lord asked? He is the finest man in all the earth. A good man who fears God and turns away from all evil. But look at this. And he has kept his faith in me. God said, I love it. I love it. He has kept his faith. Now, through all of the stuff you have put him through, God said to the enemy, for all that trash and all that garbage and all of that pain and all that destruction, he has kept his faith in me. This is why Paul told Timothy at the end of his life, he said, hey, man, I just want to let you know, I've finished the course. I've run my race. And I've kept the faith. I've held on to the confession. I have to hold on. Sometimes your ears are going, you can't possibly be saying that. Yes, I am saying that. Yes, I am saying that. My God is faithful. His word is true. I will continue to speak the promises that He's given me. I will hold on to those things. When the Bible says things like, your children shall return to you from the land of the enemy, Somebody in our church had that as a word uh, over, their, their, over their kids. More than one person in our church. I think it's a great promise. I love it. I'll take that promise. I hold to that confession. Whatever it is, whatever God has promised me, I will not let it go in the evil day. Because if I let it go, the evil day becomes a day of loss and defeat rather than victory. Keep going. Keep going. That is a determined, intentional choice. I keep going. Look up. And hold on. Hold on. Now, you may be here today, and you might be in that interim period where you're out of one and not in one. Good for you. But there are people around you today who are dealing with the evil day. Paul said you need to defend yourself. How do I defend myself? Keep going. I don't have time for this. Don't you love that thing? Ain't nobody got time for that. Somebody put a meme on Twitter that said, announcements, ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) Hold on. Keep looking up. Because he's the finisher. And keep going. Let's pray. Father, we're just so grateful that your principles and your patterns and the 
prescriptions that you have for us bring great success in our life. They bring life. They cause the Word to come to pass. They cause us to see your faithfulness. And we recognize today that the evil day is inevitable. But we also recognize that we have nothing to fear. Nothing to complain about. Nothing to be worried about. Because we know that the victory is won in our response. The victory is in our response. And whatever that is. I know that when the enemy comes to assault one of my spiritual responsibilities, I know exactly for sure what the scheme is. He's trying to take me out of the game. Take me out of the place. But today, we can align our lives according to The right kind of responses. The right kind of responses. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, maybe it might be a little bit more difficult to get your hands up in the air, but I'm going to get my hands up in the air. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit more difficult to celebrate. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult to pray. Maybe it is a little bit more difficult to relate and connect. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult to to begin to praise and Give honor to the Lord, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to take a detour. I'm not going to get put off on the side. I'm not going to let it get in me, on me, or around me. 